So good afternoon and welcome to this e-memoir session. Uh, today we're joined by the host, Please Catch My Chick, and we're looking at making the most of the adult education budget 2020 to 2021, how to optimise AEB funding through effective planning, marketing, delivery, and learner experience. And as ever, we like to keep these sessions as interactive as possible, so feel free to use the chat facility or share any questions or thoughts with the Q&A throughout the duration of this webinar. You don't have to wait until the end. You can leave a question at any point throughout the duration. Uh, say if we perhaps want to use a microphone, we'll leave that until the end of the session. You will all be receiving a copy of the video recording and slides, and I'd encourage you to share these with your colleagues and um, throughout, for, throughout your wider teams there. And if you have any thoughts about any future webinars you'd like to either um, see us pull together for you or you'd like to join us for, then please let us know. We'll be more than happy to help. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to B for a brief introduction and I will also uh, shut your um, camera down there, B. Okay then. Okay, Thanks thank all. Then. Thanks, Manik. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. As Manik said, I hope you're all well. Uh, and um, in the next um, 60 minutes or so, I'm going to be looking at um, how to make the most of our adult education budget allocation, whether you're a, a grant funded provider or uh, going through contract. Then we're looking at different ways in which we can optimize the AB funding. So we certainly um, maximize the allocation you've got, get as close to that 100, 103%, possibly see some opportunities for some interesting and innovative work with adult learners. And so I want to look a little bit about some of the marketing issues, the delivery, particularly moving some of the provision to online or blended learning, whatever it's appropriate, and how important I think the um, the COVID-19 has been in telling us about the importance of supporting adults, making sure we're in touch with them, keeping them as, a, as you know, you know, keeping them warm, keeping them on program, and therefore the importance of that learner experience. So Marit will now uh, mute my camera so we can focus on what we're going to cover this afternoon. So what I'll briefly do is, is just remind ourselves about the primary sources for uh, of funding for adult learning. The, in terms of public uh, sources, that's adult education budget and advanced learner loans. I won't be looking too much at full cost recovery to, today, but I think that's something that certainly we will want to talk about uh, in future and uh, focus a lot on what would have been considered to be normal circumstances uh, before the COVID-19 crisis, but also hopefully some kind of return to whatever that new normal is and some of the issues, particularly in the COVID-19 skills recovery plan. How to make most of national entitlements, low wage and local flexibilities. I would include uh, in there some of the other things that are going to be introduced, particularly in terms of support for unemployed learners or learners at risk of unemployment, as well as looking at some of the opportunities that adult community learning provide, non-regulated learning provide. And for those of you who operate in devolved uh, authorities, some of the opportunities that are there, but they all relate essentially to how we can increase the demand for learning amongst 19 and plus 19 and over age learners in, in England. And that's where the applications will be looked at today. I'll pick up a little bit on the COVID-19 skills recovery packages and some of those implications for, for those of you who are uh, significant providers of adult learning. And, and uh, something that uh, we did cover recently was adult traineeships, but I just want to sort of put those into that context of the recovery packages and some of the implications of devolution, particularly some of the freedoms, the flexibilities which devolved authorities are now using, particularly to reflect the needs of adults and adult learners in their own areas uh, in response to uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And what does this mean? Well, we know that there's a white paper on the future of uh, the FE uh, sector, and I think uh, different ways maybe of funding activity, maybe less emphasis on qualifications, less emphasis on what I'd call the input factor, such as guided learning hours, the, using that as a size of qualification, maybe more emphasis on outcomes, particularly some of those outcomes that relate to entry into the labour market, retention of jobs and progression in jobs. But it shouldn't just be those. And I think that's one of the things that we want to ensure. So just to remind ourselves that we're looking at the adult education budget 
roughly, you know, one and a half billion pounds in the spending plans. Now, obviously, that's going to be added to by not only what was planned before COVID in terms of the national retraining scheme, but also in some of the recovery, which are going to be additional to these current sources. And that's why your allocations will look different or have looked different in terms of your updates in August compared to what was initially uh, allocated to you. However, one thing to note historically, particularly with the AB, is it's been regularly underspent. Now, how whether it's underspent by 10 million, 60 million, or, or more than 100 million, but certainly this is uh, activity that could have been funded that hasn't been actually undertaken, and that's outside of the, the, the normal tolerance that we talk about here. One thing to note, and this is something obviously that's been picked up in the review of the FE sector, is that if you just go back to 2015-16, there are one million fewer learners. It's even worse when you go back to 2010. But, and, and that includes even in areas where you'd imagine that uh, the provision would be demanded, for example, English and maths, where there's been a fall in the last uh, nine years of almost 200,000 learners. What obviously makes the whole of the adult education budget pattern different in terms of how it's allocated and uh, the activities that are funded is the devolution of the AB to now seven, originally six, um, mayoral combined authorities, and of course the delegation of the AB to the Greater London Assembly. So that's just over 50% of activity is now funded through devolved arrangements and the remainder through the ESFA. And I know some of you clearly are providers who are operating both uh, within uh, uh, the national context as well as within a devolved authority. What is also something that's being reviewed and looked at and uh, we know that there have been significant uh, consultations on is on subcontracting but within the adult education budget there are still significant volumes of subcontracting where you as a prime will be subcontracting the actual delivery of the learning to a, a, a good quality partner. So that's the major focus of what we'll be looking at today. We have got a, another um, uh, uh, webinar next week which is going to be looking at advanced learner loans and how they uh, uh, are being in, impacted on and could be impacted on by the current uh, crisis. That was set for the last full year before this year at £480 million. Again there's been a significant underspend in adult, in adult learner loans to totaling almost a billion pounds since their, their introduction. What is noticeable is that there's been a fall in demand up until this year uh, amongst older learners, and there's been uh, a, an increase, obviously, in the demand from 19 to 23 year olds when it was expanded to them. That age group uh, has got access to a whole range of provision, partly funded through the AB, but also in some cases through advanced learner loans. What is also noticeable is a poor take up. Uh, particularly of loan funded activity from learners from disadvantaged communities and generally an issue about how accepting uh, learners are of debt uh, that uh, has been uh, incurred in the funding of learning. What is noticeable is that after a really good start where FE colleges took a significantly high proportion of the advanced learner loans facilities, that's now uh, uh, falling quite significantly as a proportion and it's the private training providers that are now increasingly active in the loans market. One point to note is it's a bit early to tell how the recovery from the uh, COVID crisis is affecting the demand for loans, but uh, certainly I've heard anecdotally in some places it's uh, been quite good. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, I've uh, also seen it uh, fall off quite significantly as there are concerns about the, the future of people's jobs, et cetera. So that's the sort of, if you want, the, the, the sources of funding that we're going to be looking at here. So what do we know about the, well, we know that the AB is made up of what the adult, previously the adult skills budget, which includes traineeships, which of course for 19 to 24 year olds will uh, continue to be a national priority and funded directly by the ESFA. That hasn't been delegated to combined authorities. And that's formula funded using the funding formula, which I'll just remind you briefly of later on. Then there's the two other sources, community learning, which of course is, is very critical, as well as discretionary learner support, which of course is the hardship fund, the help for learners with uh, childcare and with residential costs, which isn't formula driven. 
And formula driven is based usually on, form, on funding claims during the year and obviously at the year end. And the big component there, of course, is community learning. Now, I know that some of you are listening in today you're using you are you're using community learning if you're if you're if you're funded in part by community learning and in part through the formula then that you're using community learning often to do those activities which are not necessarily always qualification bearing which are measured in a different way which are different levels and different types of activity often linking up to things like the health agenda to working with uh, uh, ESOL learners, basic skills, etc. One thing to note, though, is that uh, one of the best ways of, of maximizing your AB is to maximize your community learning in terms of its progression, or if you're working with a partner that's a community learning provider, in terms of offering that uh, flexibility of offer and progression to formula funded in terms of creating ladders of progression at local level. And one way to max certainly on AB is to have that a strategic partnership approach with, for example, community learning, the third sector, if that's not what your primary source of funding is. So what, what are the basic principles? Well, I think I'm going to focus less on the supply side and a different, uh, what I'd call, in, 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 impactful measures that are being introduced by respective governments to change the structures in terms of uh, colleges, private training providers, local authorities, etc. qualifications on offer. I'm going to focus much more on the demand side, and that is how do you activate the demand from adults to undertake learning, which is absolutely critical, and then how do we actually uh, finance and fund that activity? In many cases, of course, adults will undertake learning but we'll have a barrier in their way. And that barrier might be funding, it could be access, it could be a disability, it could be a learning need, or it could be childcare requirements or whatever. So there are some barriers that we have to look at. But I think the critical thing here is the most successful providers of, of A, B provision are those which have moved away from the plan and provide. Here's our curriculum offer. We tidy up what we did last year, we put it out to people and then we see if they come. And that's been, I think, very much replaced in the last 10, to 15 years by much more of a demand-led model, which you will see in very successful providers, which is having a whole range of means by which we identify what the demand for learning is amongst those learners, those adult learners, whether that's coming from outreach work, there's no, you know, there's no replacement for that type of uh, work with uh, uh, hard to reach communities and individuals through market research, through labor market intelligence, through working with employers, working with local authority data, all those different sources. And of course, working with your existing learners who give you so much information about why they've chosen to learn, why they've chosen to learn what they've learned and why they're learning with you and how that they, they came to finance it. So this is very much a demand led approach, which means that the most successful providers of AB have that close communication, that close contact with their respective markets. And underpinning all of this is what motivates adult learners to learn. So once that motivation is clear, whether it be personal development, because they're unemployed, maybe seeking employment, upskilling, uh, changing professions or, 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 or occupations, or just become being equipped with the skills that allow them to learn, to maybe to go into higher education and progress, those are very critical things. And there's no replacement for understanding uh, and what drives uh, uh, adults to, to learning. And I think that it should then be underpinned in your approach to working with uh, learners who are unemployed, learners who might have uh, fees as a barrier, learners who are looking for progression, particularly to HE with access to HE, et cetera. So what benefits are they seeking from the learning? And can you as a provider identify and articulate those benefits clearly in terms of, well, this skill improves your ability to learn. This skill will get you a job. English and maths will help you to do X. Digital skills will help you to do Y. And I think that also is very critical when you're looking at the, the structure of your AEB demand, where what kind of learners are coming to you, what ones are in work, what are the ones that are not in work, and that's going to be an increasing feature, what drives and what motivates them, etc. And can you plug yourself in to those different motives? But also that even within an established group, demand changes quite significantly. So over a year, you know, better weather, lighter nights will change 
uh, learning uh, needs and preferences and styles. Uh, the whole of uh, the, the lockdown, we've switched so many adults over to blended and online learning, some very successfully, less others, but also it's the impact of fashions and weather, etc. But I think what's becoming, I think, more important and increasingly important is how do they want the learning delivered? Um, I was talking to a provider recently who had very long courses. When they shortened them and asked those learners to come in a little bit more each week, they had better patterns of participation, retention and achievement. Those learners preferred those shorter concentrated periods of learning. There will still be other learners that want something different. And I think you know, the last question we often ask is, is, or one of the last questions is, how much are they willing to pay for the learning? That's not the first question. The first thing is, why do you want to learn? What do you want to learn? And then how are you going to go about financing it? But also, I think one of the things that is clear in the way that the AB is structured, and particularly some of the changes like the low wage waiver, uh, local flexibilities, is that those factors which might stop learners from you know, learning, those barriers have got to be addressed in some way, uh, partly through policy making, partly through the way that you behave. Uh, so, for example, is it a welcoming environment? Are you providing childcare? Are you, um, uh, what do you call it, guiding people to where the sources of funding are, for example, or the different forms of support? And then I think the key thing is the most successful AB providers are those that have ladders of progression, uh, internally, externally with partners identified quite early on so that learners can always see, well, there's something else I can do. And that relationship is one that's a much more sustainable, we, we obviously are, uh, you know, used to terms such as lifetime and lifelong learning. So one of the key questions that I posed to you before we, and these are questions basically that I'm going to pose this afternoon, which I want you to think about in your own context, but also to discuss maybe uh, with colleagues at a, a later date. So how do you use ILR data for market analysis? So what does it tell you about what your AB has been used for? What kinds of learners, age groups, sector groups, geographical groups, penetration by postal code, etc. Unemployed, employed. But I think the key thing here is what comes first is to, to make sure that we understand what motivates learners to learn and then how to pay for it. So that's the premise. You'll be familiar with how the AB is, is constructed basically to answer some of those questions. It's primarily to engage learners, to engage adults, to give them the skills and the learning needed for whatever their in the motivation is, whether it be to get a job, to move on to the apprenticeship, to do further learning, to for personal development, for competence, for citizenship, whatever. But it enables them to do it by giving them qualifications which are tailored to meet their needs, but also types of programs which might not have qualifications in them, which might help those that are furthest away from learning or employment. So they're, they're you know, got several stages to go through, as well as all kinds of activities such as preparation for life, re-engagement, independent living, employability skills, etc. Tying this up also with things like health and well-being. And I think what, what we've got to understand is that us as providers, if we know that there's a source of funding that can be there to fund the demand from adults for learning is to have the confidence as well as the freedom and flexibility to design those programs, which can include qualifications as well as non-qualification activity to make sure that we meet those needs. So it's very much a demand led approach. And that does allow you to have a range of activities from pre-entry entry, right up to level three for 19 to 23 year olds that haven't used up their entitlements as well as non-regulated learning. What is different, of course, in this context, there's also a, a delegate, a, a devolved nature of it, which of course very much focuses if you're a provider working in say Greater Manchester or, or Liverpool or North of Tyne, that says that you've also got to understand what drivers there are at local level in terms of things like participation, in terms of attainment, in terms of gaps where, for example, there's a skill shortage. And this, of course, allows not only that to be reflected in the way that a devolved authority works, but also variations in the rules and rates of funding that could be applied 
in those areas. So although we have a national formula, it can be applied in different ways in those devolved areas. So I'll go through this. The, I think we're all fairly familiar with the legal entitlements. They don't change, but they've immediately removed a barrier. For anyone who's 19 to 23, or anyone who hasn't yet reached a certain level of English and maths, there are barriers have been removed. They do not have to find a fee. So that decision to learn is then not having a second part to it, which is, and how do I pay for it? You don't have to pay for it because this is being said to so important that the state is subsidizing it to 100% of the cost. That extends, of course, to many learners who are also unemployed. And we'll come back to that. And also, I think that reflects that that provision is not only at level two and three, but also includes a whole range of other activities which might get people up to that first level two and beyond. What's been added now, of course, in the last uh, three years, this will be the third year of application, is the low wage waiver, which of course is removing another barrier. I'm not unemployed, I'm at work, but my earnings are, are not high enough or so low that actually finding the cost of a course, even if it's only 50% of the course, is acting as a barrier. I want, I've, I've got the motivation to learn. I know why I'm trying to, why I'm, what I'm trying to achieve, but I've got an obstacle, one barrier there, which of course is finding the cash contribution. And we know that that's changed uh, uh, for 2020, 21, a different level there, uh, but also to recognize that the use of that waiver, which can attract, of course, certain categories of learners, for example, into ESOL, is uh, using up more of your actual allocation. And therefore you can achieve 100% of your allocation with obviously the fewer learners because you're not having to uh, find the, they're not having to find the 50% of the basic cost. That, that, that can vary by the way, because Greater London, Greater Manchester have actually increased the, um, the amount, the, what they call the low wage threshold. But I think what is important there is that that obviously means that the cost of collecting fees, which of course is another, another element in this. So here are the full legal entitlements and what you'll notice is that there's the first full level two, the first full level three, English and maths for those people who haven't yet achieved a GCSE at grade four above. And of course the new legal entitlement, which I think should be a significant area of growth for you, which is information technology, the digital skills for those learners that have, uh, who you assess as being below level one. So this includes entry and level one uh, programs, obviously those have got to be the essential digital skills qualifications. So here you have an immediate question. If that's the case and you know about legal entitlements, how have you used the legal entitlements and how have you focused on those target groups? How do you know which learners don't have the first full level two, don't have the first level three, you haven't got English and maths in your areas? Does your market research, your outreach and your your, your engagement with learners tell you, so you can then target them and say, well, here you are, here's an offer for you. It's called English and Maths, it's called Digital Skills. And I think with those two sets of, of, of things, I would like to say that one of the key things that we should be, given that the fact that the numbers have dropped significantly in English and Maths, is to say, well, what are you doing to target English and Maths? Yeah. And what are you doing to target uh, essential digital skills so that you can put those bits of provision in, in the offer, knowing that there's a demand there because you've done your market research, but also tagging them on, English and maths tagged on to a vocational program, onto, for example, a diploma in fitness, digital skills being offered alongside employability skills. So these are questions again, that I want you to consider at your leisure. So in other words, how well do you use the legal entitlements to max and optimize your AB? If you're not, then think about uh, strategies and tactics to do it. Uh, and here, of course, is a table to remind you, that's a table, by the way, that's been updated to take account of the flex, the, the one year high value courses, as well as the, uh, the parts of the, um, the, the new entitlement in digital skills. So you can see the new digital skills entitlement is there, right? essential digital skills qualifications up to and including level one, fully funded for all age groups. So remember that. And also the, um, the high value um, one year courses, which I'll come to later on, part of the COVID-19 uh, skills recovery passage, pack, package. So that, that, that's basically saying this is the types of, these are the types of provision which the uh, ESFA is fully funding for the learner. And therefore, once, they've, once you can encourage them to learn, 
you're removing an, uh, an automatic barrier uh, to their participation, which is having to find the fee. Now, of course, there are all kinds of programs that are likely to be coming along. We'll talk a wee bit about these in terms of the unemployed. But again, remind yourselves about the definition of unemployment, which of course has to be reflected in uh, that which you can then apply the discretion to. But obviously you've got a wider discretion for those learners on other forms of state benefits uh, whose earnings are below a set threshold where of course they might be seeking employment. One of the key questions that I would then pose is, if you know that from your local area, there is already information coming through about which sectors and which individuals are already unemployed, who've been made redundant as a result of uh, coronavirus, or who are under threat of unemployment, then I think an immediate question is, are you already taking account of that in your plans for programmes for the unemployed using the, um, the, 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 the AEB with its roles and its guidance and its, 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 um, its concessions? that it makes to the unemployed and taking account of that and then identifying what kinds of programs would be, whether it be employability skills, job set skills, or retraining uh, or upskilling into jobs that might actually be in demand. So again, I think here, the key question is how are you going about identifying what kind of impacts, you know, in your local labour market, who's now likely to be unemployed? Is it in hospitality, catering, tourism? So why is still making that provision? The provision would be better moving over into those things where there might be some job opportunities like green energy, health and social care. And you're going to have that, uh, that transition where you can make that, those programmes for the unemployed available. So again, using that, Using the discretion, using obviously the low wage waiver, which again is fully employing, uh, fully funding those learners. You know, you can go through all the, the sort of, you can, you can read how it's structured. But the most important thing about this is where those, those learners who are in those pay brackets, which are just, you know, below those levels I'm talking about, you can now say, well, you previously would have had to find 50% or would have had to apply another, dis another um, discretion with you, now we can say, well, look, that fee is being removed. So key question is, how do you promote this offer to the low paid? So how are you doing it? Is it appearing through your publicity? Is it appearing in your, uh, do all of your enrollment teams talk about this? Is this an aspect of uh, the way in which you uh, do this through your website or through your different uh, outreach? And what's been the impact of that change so far? We've been, certainly I'm talking here as a director of two training companies as well as the governor of a college. We found that after a slow start, this has started to certainly pick up. And therefore for a lot of learners, who we spend quite a lot of time, you know, finding out what they want to learn, to, to, to see what drives them, to see what motivates them, is we're now finding that we're, they're more likely inclined to come to us because they don't have to find 50% of the cost of the program. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, I hope, uh, is everyone seeing the slides moving on, Marek? I just received a message from, uh, I think there was one of the participants who, who was still stuck on one, but I'll just check, could somebody else just check, they, they are moving on, because they have been for myself, I just want to check. And if, if possible, Bij, if you can just get a, a little bit closer to the mic as well, just to check, because it was a wee bit, yeah, I think everybody else seems to be fine. So again, if that um, participant is struggling, I did drop a message in there, it might be worth just logging out, logging back in, and hopefully that will resolve any issue there. And I say you'll all receive a copy of the video recording and slides. So we'll make sure you haven't missed anything. And thanks everybody for getting back to us there with the uh, messages. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to ask at this point what, um, thanks Marek, uh, what people have found with the low wage waiver in, in their experience of it over the first two years. How, if, what kind of impact has it made? And also the fact that some of you have got you know, if you're in, in a devolved, if you're in London or Greater Manchester, actually these thresholds are set at higher levels. So uh, we got a couple of responses there. Great, thank you. Yes, it's after a slow start, they're very similar to ours. Little impact yet, not really featured very much yet. And I think we've rehearsed some of the other, the other responses as well, but that's great. Thank you for that. So again, it's using 
the low wage waiver, the uh, what we call the legal entitlements, using the local flexibility, which of course is there to give you the opportunity to create programs which reflect the needs of the local area, a mixture of qualifications, non-regulated uh, qualified programs, leading helping people to get into the first full level two at entry and level one, but also those people that might already have a level two in the local area, there might be a need for retraining or upskilling, which I think is going to be very relevant. Here, of course, you've got to choose the programs, which of course the awarding bodies have had uh, go through a process to ensure they can be offered in the local flexibility. So they've got to be on the hub. So be careful about this. And obviously it includes things like ESOL, but also non-regulated learning, where for example, you're using RARPA to recognize and record progress and achievement. And I think again, local flexibilities for, 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 for us have been very useful, not only to find those learners that want to do entry and level one provision before they can progress to level two, particularly in the 19 to 23 age group, we could, we've used them alongside the legal entitlement. So we've packaged it for some learners where we know what the route is, we know what drives them, we know what motivates them. So I need to focus on my maths, but also need employability skills. So we've got used the local flexibility for the employability skills, the national legal entitlement for functional skills. One point to note, not all local flexibility programs are fully funded. They can be fully funded or co-funded. What you've got to do is take account the person's prior attainment, circumstances and age, etc. But the local flexibility for us has been critical in identifying where there's particular issues that need to be addressed at local level and then we're uh, introducing that local flexibility. And that combination of programs, including non-regulated learning, I think has been very useful uh, in, in, in using up not only the whole of our allocation, but in then getting people on ladders of progression because those learners that are doing the level entry and level one of the local flexibility, very often are then progressing into the national entitlements if they're 19 to 23. If they're uh, unemployed, they've been able to progress into other programs for the unemployed. And in, and in many cases, they've been able to progress to employment and then become uh, funded through uh, apprenticeships. So again, how well are you using local flexibilities to make the most of your AB allocation? And I think that question, you've got to go back and say, well, have we really got our program areas, our curriculum areas, to see the opportunities there to activate adult learning and then use the funding to, to uh, finance it? Similarly, for non-regulated learning for adults, we know that this includes a whole range of things from independent living skills to uh, community learning and locally devised short technical tasters where, for example, it's, it's, it's activating entry into a particular area. But I mean, a question I often pose to providers is how much non-regulated learning? You know, I was asked by a provider who was tremendously short of their AB, they weren't, were well outside the tolerance. They weren't any offering any non-regulated learning because the you know, previous manager says that it wasn't fundable. It is of course fundable as long as you make sure it, it complies with the conditions and where there is a demand, particularly from adults who are maybe in, you know, in transition from a community learning program at pre-entry level might need something at entry level that uh, doesn't frighten them off, it doesn't scare them because the motivation might be, well, I've had a prior experience of education that wasn't brilliant, I was frightened of exams, is there another way in which I can be assessed through ARPA uh, uh, or whatever? But also this offers us the opportunity inside because a lot of these programs we fund on the basis of uh, guided learning hours or total qualification time, we can put blended learning in there at the appropriate level, certainly not at entry, I would have not thought, but at, at level ones and two, you might find there's some opportunities. Most provision, I think that uh, in non-regulated provision here would have to meet these eligibility criteria. So obviously always remind yourselves of these particular principles being applied because non-regulated learning shouldn't be a replica of regulated learning and it shouldn't be uh, uh, usually at any level other than entry level one. We've got some at level two, but level two in our case is mostly on technical provision where there isn't a regulated program available yet, particularly in new sectors or in emerging sectors. So again, question for you all to, to, to uh, pose uh, in your own organization is, how are we using non-regulated learning to get learners in at the beginning of their uh, learning journey 
and using it for progression purposes, and are we making most effective use of it? When it comes to things like, for example, literacy, numeracy, and ESOL, that's a classic example of where non-regulated learning does start people off on that uh, progression path. And, uh, you know, again, um, what progression opportunities can you offer? Because if you look at this, you can see that they could progress to English and math programs, they could use stepping stone, they could use functional skills. In some cases, the progression could be to uh, a GCSE. So again, non-regulated literacy, numeracy, ESOL, alongside other forms of non-regulated provision, uh, ag again, responding to that demand but here you've got to make sure that you have the quality assurance in place and I, I won't uh, rehearse that again with you. The other area I think that again within the AB is not being exploited as much as learning in the workplace. Now I know there's, there's, there's the conditions obviously but for example are you targeting people in the workplace who haven't yet used up their legal entitlement? Um, I'll come back to English and maths in a minute and this now of course extends to digital skills. Now, as long as you comply with paragraph 175.5, we will not fund any qualification or learning aim delivered at an employee's workplace and is either relevant to their job or their employer's business, unless it's a legal entitlement or it's something which has been specifically uh, asked for through a national concession or as part of the Princess Trust team program. It's, a, it's, it's important to it's about the word and there in that paragraph, but I think what is, is critical here is that there are programs that you can offer outside of apprenticeships, which can, uh, working with employers, with trade unions, actually be offered to people in a workplace, including your own workplace. So for example, functional skills in English and maths or digital skills for people in work, not just focusing on the unemployed or people about to access the labour market. So inside the labour market, outside of apprenticeships, how much are you doing with employers to upskill their staff using the AEB? Good question. And I think, again, something for you to consider. So again, you can see that here you're responding to demand in the workplace, where it could be, which, which could be for the national entitlement for the 19 to 23. It could be for English and maths, which could extend right through the whole age group could be for digital skills, or it could be for a technical program that is not a, a, an apprenticeship. But again, it's something that people can do in their own time. So for example, they could do it by distance learning. So it could be, for example, in the health and social care sector, but it's not directly relevant to the job or their employer's business. And I think that is, is, is or it's being delivered uh, you know, uh, in their own time. Um, so it's getting that or bit rather than the and bit. So again, thanks very much. There's a few of doing that. English and maths for the health service op. Yes, good. Yep, yep, there's some, some programs there. Mental health awareness, good. And using some of the programs that were available for, for example, workers who were, yeah, for uh, workers who were furloughed. Thank you. That's a good example. Again, one of the providers that's listening in has had, had an extensive program available for people who are, uh, employed but furloughed and therefore are not allowed to be working and uh, they have been doing a fair number of programs mostly through blended learning uh, good opportunities there and the biggest demand there has come for mental health first aware uh, awareness mental health first aid in control of infections etc thank you for that now very specific aspects of the AB that I want to focus on now for the next uh, couple of minutes three things uh, the COVID-19 skills recovery packages, you know, this plan for jobs, there's three aspects that relate to the AB. Sector-based uh, work academies, initial £17 million pounds there. High-value courses for school and student and college leavers age 19, uh, 18 and 19. We'll focus only on the 19 bit, AB. That's an additional 100, just over £101 million pounds and traineeships, which I'll focus a little bit on. Now, the sector-based work academies, I think I got that one wrong there. You can see it's sector work-based academy, not right. It's sector-based work academies. We know that scheme's been around for a while. It's there to help Job Centre Plus claimants build their confidence. We know that. It can last up to six weeks. Three elements, pre-employment training, work experience placement, guaranteed job interview. Now, we know the AB bit, and there's now additional funding for obviously more sectors to be looked at and more provision, funds pre-employment training lasting two to three weeks. The DWP looks after all the other bits, including travel and childcare, what's on placements. 
Now, you, if you're already working in sector-based in sector -based work academies, then you're obviously, you know that there's a referral process that comes to you as part of the local design process. This is, by the way, uh, uh, added on to your AB allocation using, uh, I think if you saw the August document, uh, if you looked at the August document on how AB is being allocated to you, then you'll see that there's the, the, the subtlety and the changes there about uh, how that additional funding and how it's being prorated into your provision. But the key thing here is, if, you ha if you're already developing sector-based work academies, how are you developing this aspect of your provision? Because obviously there's going to be a lot more people that are going to be in, uh, in receipt of universal credit or JSA or ESA. And in what sectors do you think those people will be seeking to be trained into? Whether it be uh, logistics, it could be into non, it could be in, into food retail, it could be into green energy, it could be into health and social care. So again, using the uh, the uh, uh, these aspects of the AB, yeah, that's good. Good into. Uh, thanks very much there. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, David. Online level two courses, sector and LEP priority plus recruitment progression to hospital staff wanting to become nurses, or staff looking for promotion. So there's a lot of things there in that previous. Uh, package that we should be looking at. The sectors in your area which have been identified are, thank you very much, logistics, care and the civil service for us. So again, I think good examples of where that type of package and you're using the AB to, um, to fund that uh, type of provision, uh, the pre-employment training, doing that in, in collaboration obviously with Job Centre Plus. So I think that's, a, a, again, additional funding. This is new, high value courses for school work. Well, I'm going to focus on the 19 plus bit, which is funded by AB. And this is basically to offer a high value level two or three course, one year, uh, funded through the, uh, and it could be in any one of those qualifications which has been identified on the list of what we call high value courses. So a level two diploma in care, a level three diploma in engineering or something like that. Make sure, by the way, that the qualifications there are on that list that you're going to offer. It's within the AB, so this, this it, it only applies to learners who are age 19 on the 31st of August, but it's only for 19-year-olds. And uh, there are basically, uh, this is an incentive here. They can, they'll be fully funded, these learners, so no need for them to think about, uh, about uh, finding uh, the funding through a loan. Yeah, thank you very much with Princess Trust Programme there again. Good. Um, and that's that's to take account of this. The second thing to note is that there's going to be an increase of £400 per learning aim. So that uh, that rate of funding for that adult who's 19, who could be one of your 18-year-olds last year, who's now coming back as a 19-year-old and still hasn't found a job, who needs that uh, high value, maybe, redirection or addition to the programme. And here, by the way, if the learner does move on to uh, the job, obviously that job's got to be, there's got to be conditions on the length of the job, et cetera, then you'll be able to claim 20% of the funding, which rather than the half that they normally claim, which is the 10%. Remember, job outcome payments, if the person does not complete the program, are only 10%, whereas in this case, it's 20%. So you can see there's significant uplifts here. And again, this is additional to your AB allocation that you had before August. So again, if you have a very simple tool here, which says, well, look at the number of people that left us last year who are now 19. Have they found a job yet? No. Can we offer them uh, this uh, uh, as a one year fully funded program with that uplift? Or do we have information about how many 19 year olds that are in our area kicking, uh, seeking employment in these key sectors? Remember, this is sector driven. So again, thank you very much there. Good examples there of contacting students if they've actually seen if they've got if for example have all of your leavers from last year gone to their intended um destinations if they haven't then they might need another year with you and as long as in these areas some might convert from a level two to level three some might be doing a, a one-year level two in the right sector so this is of i think quite an important addition to the range of provision we can make that makes sure that we maximize and make a hundred percent use of our aeb take advantage of them, as well as the new investment in traineeships. Now, last week we did a webinar on traineeships. This is obviously part of the plan for jobs, £111 million being put in this year for an extra 30,000. 
so, uh, many of those will be the 19 to 24 age group. We know there's a, a bonus for each um, uh, learner taken on by an employer, so a maximum of 10. Most, of course, will be much smaller than that. And, of course, to also note that the traineeship is fully funded for any learner uh, for the core programs, uh, not necessarily for their, their, what do you call it, their uh, uh, flexible offer, which can be a vocational qual. But don't forget the core is work preparation, work placement, English and maths, and digital skills if they haven't already achieved it. And I think that's a very important opportunity. It was flagging, we know a bit, but also it can include now those learners that already have a level three, whereas before they all had to have no more than a level two. So that flexibility could, of course, make a group, another group of learners um, um, uh, more attracted to the program, and this obviously applies for this full year from the 1st of September to the, 30, uh, the sorry, the 11 months to the 31st of July. The, the condition for 100 hours of work placement is now reduced to 70. It can be uh, um, more than, than that, obviously, if you can find that opportunity for the learner. Uh, there is a, a, an intention to increase the basic rate for the job prep, for the work preparation and the, the work placement to 1,500 pounds from the current 970 pounds, as well as the incentive payment to make to employers. There will be a procurement process, which David has informed me has not yet been publicized. So if you've not been offering traineeships before, or you want to increase your traineeship offer, then there will be a procurement uh, process that will be out in the next few weeks. I, I think the, the extension of the traineeship up to 12 months is not, is needing as much is not as relevant because most of us will try and get those young people into jobs as quickly as possible so i think we'll still be sort of most of us will be maxing around the six months mark the key thing here is that this is another part of the a b that you can use it's by the way you can't via between these different things the the traineeship is a part of your a b so you have an a b allocation of which this tells you how much the traineeship offer is, but you might obviously want to go for growth. You might want to, when there's a, an, an invitation for you to, 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 to apply for more traineeships, to take advantage of it, as well as the new procurement, as the procurement for, uh, that's going to be announced in the next few weeks. But again, don't forget a traineeship is still a training program. It's not an apprenticeship. It leads into the apprenticeship. It isn't the same as kickstart because kickstart the learner will be uh, taken on by uh, the, the the young person will be taken on by the uh, employer and the subsidy will the wage whether it be the apprenticeship wage or re respective to their age or the, the one that's relevant to the age will be paid for traineeship there is no wage unless of course the employer wishes to make a contribution towards the cost of the learner so again are you already offering or intending to offer adult traineeships in what occupational areas, and again, that's got to reflect at the local or sub-regional level where the demand for jobs is likely to be in your area. And I think that then takes us on to another golden opportunity, but only those that obviously are in Mayo combined authorities, is that uh, devolution allows you to also plug in and, and through the devolved AB, deliver programs that are very much based on that local demand and need. So here the need is being articulated on behalf of individual citizens in that area by the devolved authority. And that obviously means that you've got to plug yourself into local strategic skills plans. So what priorities have they identified? And then you can obviously make the provision that meets those needs because they've done a lot of the work for you uh, through a lot of the, the SAPs that are in place to, to identify individual sector needs within that locality. And then it gives the devolved authority the flexibility to, for example, change the rates, which have happened in London, or different ways of earning the funding, which might attach themselves much more to things like job outcomes or other forms of outcomes. But the national entitlements will still be the responsibility at, at central level. So there are lots of opportunities because obviously it, it means you can have variations on things like the, the low wage waiver, in London, uh, same in Greater Manchester, it could regenerize a lot of adult learning because there's a lot more freedom and flexibility to vary rates and things like that, so that it becomes more attractive for you as the provider to put it on, 
in response to demand. You can align it with other funding streams such as the work and health programs, ESF, Job Centre Plus, which gives us more integrated approaches. So that, you know, that, that means that all these different stakeholders come together to increase things like skill, level, skill levels, productivity, working with those people that are most disadvantaged in the labour market as well as you know, new subcontracting arrangements where the prime might be able to secure a contract and then work with partners to deliver the different parts of it. I think also we're getting more innovative approaches from that local bottom-up approach with a much wider range of outcomes in terms of things like uh, progression, uh, improving the health and well-being of the local community and I think also it could identify where there's particular skill shortages maybe at higher levels which have got to be addressed so um, that's really working yeah that's great that, that, that that's working well now the other thing is it's working well as long as the partners are all there I think that's a point that one of you has just made thanks for that the other thing is experimentation we've seen some very innovative approaches to digital skills for the unemployed at local level which we wouldn't have seen through a national through the national funding approach so again i think you can max your your and, and optimize the use of your ab in devolved uh, authorities by looking at some of these these in, these flexibilities and freedoms i think ultimately it could relax some of the rules and allow a wider choice of courses for example much more we've been in one area particularly asked to put on more pre-entry esol english and maths and now digital skills so i think that shows you how the, uh, the devolved arrangement might work. We all know how AB funding works, and I, I won't spend too much time on that. We know how the formula works. And of course, one of the big issues there is, and I'll still come back to it, you cannot maximize the, 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 the allo allocation you'd be given if you don't have participation, right? If you don't have the right numbers and lenders to start with, but also, if you don't focus on retention and achievement, because there's nothing worse than finding we've got all those learners, we've met demand, but we haven't kept them because the learner experience, the teaching and learning, the support for the learners has not been of the right quality, delivered in the wrong way, you know, without maybe the support, without maybe additional learning, without childcare, et cetera. So those are still important aspects of maxing out on your AB, as well as obviously understanding that um, funding rates do not change depending on how you deliver the learning. And therefore, this experience, I think, of COVID-19 has really brought to the front how online learning, blended learning, could be another way of enhancing the learning, of maybe bringing in people that otherwise didn't want to come. But at the same time, you've got to get the balance right with those people who prefer face-to-face uh, uh, work with the tutors and the socializing they get with working with other learners. So we know how the formula works, we know what the matrix is made up of and the uh, other, but I just want to pick aspects of it. English, math and digital skills for me are still one area which I don't think we're fully exploiting. We know there are still millions of learners in England who have, of adults, who have low levels of English and maths and of course we know with digital skills as a result of the, the um, work that's been done on that. So with those being quite well funded, GCSE English and Maths funded at uh, 811, functional skills at 724, other than entry level maths, which is a much higher rate. And of course, what the new rates are for uh, digital skills. So my uh, assertion is that, uh, and certainly we've put a lot of investment into this, is that this should be a major aspect of our provision for adults. We know that there is a, a big demand, but it's about how we deliver it. Can we deliver it short and fat in, in bite-sized chunks? One of the things that drives one of the awarding bodies that we work with, Ascent, is, is very much that stepping stones approach with, from pre-entry up to an including level two, and making sure that that is always being done at the pace at which the learners can cope with. And growing that provision, particularly with employed learners, working with the DWP with unemployed learners, I think should be a big aspect of your provision. And I'm, I'm glad that a couple of you have identified it. Thanks very much. We've had a bit of support there. Yeah, I mean, one of the issues there, that, uh, it's a good question. One of you has posed the question is non-accredited learning. Uh, it, it is it, it, non-accredited where, where you're offering English and maths and ESOL is very important as, 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 uh, as a way of getting learners in. And I think that, 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 that sort of, you know, getting on the progression ladder to possibly stepping stone qualifications, which are uh, 
uh, nationally recognized as well as functional skills and GCSEs is critical. Um, and whether, whether I think you've got those uh, genuine assessments that show that learners are operating at that level, don't worry about it. Whether they're employed or unemployed, it's appropriate to the learner because you've done that initial and diagnostic assessment. So it's a, a good point you've raised there. And I don't, uh, you know, the digital entitlement, I know that some of you are, are concerned, but you haven't got, the, there's only one awarding body, I think, that's been through the whole of this process yet. So the, the essential digital skills qualifications are not ready yet. They can't be offered yet. But I think that uh, commitment is there within the, the latest guidance, which I'm just repeating there. And I think the other thing to note, uh, just to cover that, yes, it's, if, yep, question. Well, I mean, I think it's a matter of waiting. I know you're going to have to advertise that you're going to put on digital skills programs, but until you know which awarding body you're wanting to work with, um, then I think you've got to sort of hold back on that. But there's no reason why you can't do the assessment, etc., to identify, for example, amongst your existing learners, how many, when you're using the digital skills framework, are operating at below level one. And I think you'll see that there's quite a lot of demand there. And then obviously identify that demand and say, well, look, we're, we're just about to put on some provision or we'll be running provision maybe from late November, December, January, whatever. So that might be a strategy. The last thing to note, I think, for me is that the two things that, that, ask, that, that sit there inside the formula, one inside the formula, one outside the formula, that perhaps are not being... A, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Joanna. It's, yeah, is that there's, there is the, a lot of adult learning... Uh, learners are not aware of the fact that they can get learning support if they have any individual needs, which can be fundable through the AB allocation, whether it be a, a, a grant or contract. And that's coming to you as a provider, £150 per month per learner, once you've identified and assessed the needs, put a plan in place, and then delivered the learning support through an LSA, a small class size, or whatever. And for me, that, that's very important to uh, identify as one aspect of meeting the demand for those learners. And it's also a way of retaining your learners. So if you identify that learners have got a barrier to learning, which could be a learning difficulty or whatever, then A, you can get them to participate. B, they'll stay, they'll be retained because you've identified whether it be dyslexia, uh, literacy need, uh, numeracy need, or a, a disability, you've identified it and you're putting the support in place. And then you're seeing the benefits in improved participation, retention, and achievement. So I ask you those questions again, internally pose them and have a discussion. Are we making the best use of our learning support allocation? It's the same, yes, the question is, it's, the, it's, a, it's a national rate of £150 per month. If the learner needs more than £150 in any one month, because you've got some, except you've got some what we call excess costs, you can claim anything above £150 through the earnings adjustment statement. Ask your MI manager about it. Now, I bet you there's a lot of you listening in today that don't fully optimise your adult learning support and make the best use of it. And, you know, you might end up saying, well, we, we didn't, we don't, we, we'd identify, but we haven't got the means to su support it because the £150, it, where is it in this, in the allocation? It's in the allocation. It's not separately identified. But what is important is that uh, it's an investment and it does produce, it overcomes a barrier, it keeps learners and it helps them to achieve. So uh, it is a fixed rate of £150 per month. As far as I know, in most of the um, devolved authorities, it's the same, but I, I wouldn't want to be, yeah, I wouldn't want to uh, say that for sure in every. So I would check up on that, Lynn. David, good point there. Use whatever means you can to identify those individual needs, whether it be um, some of you will use Cognacyst, others will have your own. Uh, assessment tools. Again, best way to record it, to monitor it, to track it, use it, your, your, um, whatever your MI system is, use whatever they've got for it, learning support. I, I'm obviously a keen fan of, of spirals, um, but uh, whatever works for you. In terms of non-formula, the adult learning support is discretionary. The learner support here again is to, again, Individually, for those individuals who have got any financial support needs because of hardship, because of childcare, because there's any residential cost, or 
Don't forget now the response to COVID-19. So for example, if you've had, ad, you've converted a lot of your learning to online learning, but you've got adults who don't have access to Wi-Fi, don't have access to iPads or to the, that type of technology, you can, you, you can claim funding for them from your allocation to meet their individual needs. Uh, you can lend them tools, et cetera. You can lend them kit and obviously try and get that back. But again, these are all aspects of you using your discretionary learner support. And, you know, as long as you meet all those requirements, it differs between whether you're grant funded or uh, your AB is through a contract, they're slightly different. But again, it's using what's available there. Yes, and again, it's always making sure that those things fit uh, the needs of the individual learner and match up whatever those individual learners requirements are. But remember, this is not uh, a, a, an entitlement. It is discretionary. So you've got to have clear uh, criteria which are being applied here. Uh, and of course, it's out. Uh, yeah. OK, so finally, a couple of things then just to wrap things up uh, and then I'll just say a few words about I think that you know, once you've thought about what how you identify the demand for learning from adults, using the AB through its different aspects, you can start to see how we convert that demand for learning into actual programs where people go on the programs, they complete them and they progress. You can, of course, think of it another way. Your planning and delivery of adult learning has got to be able to make the best use of the matrix, um, making sure that where you've got programs, you're using the right mix of face-to-face -face and blended learning. So if you've got a total qualification time program of 150, are you delivering 100 hours face-to-face -face and 50 through blended learning? How do you audit and keep uh, evidence of that at the appropriate level? For me, the other thing is to see AB as not a sort of September to July, but as a continuous flow of activity, we've got lots of learners who've started AB programs before the end of the last academic year, who are now carrying on into this year. Some of them have had breaks in learning, we know that because of COVID, but we've also got new learners and new start points. I know that we offer ESOL starts four times a year. I know some of you offer it six times a year. It's got to reflect the patterns of demand. Adults do not work on academic years. They don't work on September through to July. There are different drivers there, for example, different needs. I think also to have flexibility in the method of delivery. You know, we found that shorter, more intensive beauty therapy courses hold the learners better, we get better achievements, rather than stringing it out, you know, one night a week for 36 weeks. Getting that environment right, which includes all those other things around it, like the careers advice, et cetera, the, the learning support, the learner support. But let's just look at the, the improve, improving the learner experience. From every minute that that learner's with you, from pre-enrollment to post-completion, how good is that? Uh, how good do they feel about the program they've had and about themselves and about you? So making sure that we use the best, you know, the blended learning and other technologies that support learners. And then obviously linking up with what are the priorities at the LEP level, the Mayo Combined Authority, WP, which could be employability skills, health and well-being, social inclusion, uh, emotional resilience, uh, you know, given what's happened in the, 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 the COVID situation. But I think many of you, I, I would strongly suggest if you're not already doing it, plug yourself into your local skills advisory panels, your SAPs. Very often your principals or senior team members will be on them because that's identifying priority needs, particularly at local level. And that should be activating what you're going to do. Because, for example, during uh, coronavirus, we've already continued. We continue to deliver adult learning wherever possible using subcontracting arrangements, using online learning, supporting furloughed learners. And that's got us to address these issues. How much of our provision have we been able to move online? How effective has our learning platform, our virtual been in supporting learning outside the classroom? And what else have we had to do to support those learners with laptops, iPads, one-to-ones, mentoring? So I think this has given us a golden opportunity to start looking at different ways of optimizing uh, the AB, which might of course be a characteristic that we have to continue with. What's the new normal gonna look like? So the government promised us a lot of things before uh, COVID-19. 
I just want to highlight those that already started to say that the NRS, for example, National Retraining Scheme, was already pumping additional funding. And that was already factored into AB allocations for 2021 prior to COVID, um, prior to lockdown, should I say, to help workers prepare for a changing labour market. We didn't realise how radical that change labour market is going to be. But I think that new focus on adult learning, which will be with the new shared prosperity fund, the capital investment, etc. We'll be looking at things like emotional resilience, mental health, why not working much more with union learning, people at risk of unemployment. And that I think it needs more. And that's why the investment in the kickstart scheme, payments to employers who are going to hire new apprentices are very critical next steps, I think, in supporting uh, people who are at risk of long-term unemployment. In addition to what I've talked about today in terms of sector-based uh, work academies, the, the high value programs, etc. So hopefully you will have looked at this today and said, right, well, I'm gonna, let's take the questions that Bees has posed and in our next meeting of our adult education teams or our curriculum teams, we'll start to answer those questions and see how we can make the best use of the AB to identify demand for learning and meet that demand for learning. And there might be some golden opportunities for you and your partners, particularly in devolved authorities, to work with the unemployed or in a sectoral uh, based uh, work academy in your LEP, if you're outside of devolved authority, to start looking at what we can do to get people to increase the skill levels and get them maybe ready to go into an apprenticeship so, you know, pre-apprenticeship programs, traineeships, etc. So, any other questions? Because you posed a fair number of questions, which hopefully I've answered as I've gone along. Any other questions? Yeah, just checking through there. I'm not sure if we've missed anything. If if you feel that we have missed any of your questions, or perhaps you need a uh, or you'd like to take any further or, or, or a slight, slight more discussion around it and feel, do feel free to get in touch with us. I say you'll all be receiving a copy of the video recording the slides and recommend you to, to sit down and share it with, with colleagues um, remote, remotely or however it is you're working these days. And again, if, if that does provoke any more questions or you'd like us to you know, look at it more, uh, more fully perhaps, then we'll be more than happy to take it further on with these. Absolutely. Thanks for that. I've had some feedback there. Yeah, don't forget the Princess Trust programme is very important. It's like the funded in slightly different ways. Just have a look at the latest guidance. But I think, as one of you has already highlighted, working with them and a, a sector-based work academy is a very, very good way of addressing the needs of a particular sector. And, and I think that uh, is a really helpful. Again, focus on the high value ones, identify those 18 and 19 year olds that haven't yet got, uh, you know, haven't been able to get to their destination that could do through uh, from a, a new level two or level three program delivered in one year. Yeah, I think we've got that. We've answered the question on non-accredited provision. Uh, Lynn, I'll, I'll find out if there's uh, the same in every devolved area, but and, and, I mean, I haven't heard of any significant differences yet. Yeah, one of you has talked about, um, yeah, yeah. If, yeah, the, the, other, the only other thing, just to go back, and uh, thanks for a few of you listening in still there, is that, yeah, these were, these were what was before COVID-19, and therefore the National Skills Funded, alongside the National Retraining Scheme, was there to reskill and upskill people. So that's already been factored into your allocation. So if you look at your allocation, there will be what they call a, a sort of a, a, an allowable growth in your allocation that reflects these... The, funding that would have gone into you to reflect your current level of activity. So you might have had a 1.5% increase in your AB or a 1.7% increase in your AB. So that, that's explained in that document, which I think uh, was published in August. Yeah, we don't know what's going to happen with the new shared prosperity fund to replace European Social Fund. So wait and see for that. Uh, I can't answer in that question anymore. Thanks very much for your response there, Gail. Thank you. Any other questions then, Marek? No, I can't see any further. Um, no, no, I think that's it for now, B. So do, do, do you want me to end the recording? Yeah, close the recording. Thanks, everyone, for listening in, and hopefully this has activated some discussion. I will